Welcome to Church Online today. We are honored that you are joining us. Now, it's not too late for you to invite someone to church today at cac.tv. Right now, you can message them. You can text them and say, hey, come to church with me this morning. You can do it right now. We've got a great story to share with you today at cac.tv. I want to read to you a portion of scripture that many of us have heard before. It is from the book of Proverbs, chapter number 31, and it simply says this, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. It is interesting that in our culture that we're living in right now, there is this subtle thought, just don't say anything. Don't say anything at work about what you might believe. Don't say anything to your friends, your neighbors. And yet, the scripture tells us not to be silent about a number of things. And today, we are honored to have Justin Reeder, the founder of Love Life, and Jessica Chapman. We're so thrilled that you're here to share your story today. Thank you both for being at uh, Church Online today. Thanks for being, Absolutely. thanks for having yeah. us, man. It's an honor. So, Justin, you are, were, and are a business owner. Yes, sir. Yeah. And four years ago, something happened that has totally transitioned your life. Can you kind of tell us what took place and why there is even an organization, really not an organization, a movement mm. called Love Life Today? Yeah, so I had some friends that invited me out to our local abortion center in Charlotte, and that really began uh, the awakening that I had back in 2012 where I realized that death and destruction was happening in our city on a scale and a magnitude like I wasn't really aware of. Honestly, I, I didn't really know this was taking place. Of course, I knew abortions were happening. I'd you know, heard discussions, heard politicians talk about it, but I'd never been to an abortion clinic. I didn't know the reality of what I call the tragic truth of our city until that day, until I went out there and I stood in front of that place and it was no longer like a statistic. It was no longer an issue. It was personal. It was real. It was right in front of me. As I, I saw that, that morning, around 30 or 40 moms walk into that abortion clinic. So you were certainly not in favor of abortion. Correct. But you had never really gotten involved. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's right. Yeah, I didn't, wasn't even really aware that it was happening. Again, this, I've been doing business with a company right across the street from the abortion clinic for almost 10 years. And I never knew this place even existed. It was back at the end of a business park, no sign on it. Um, and it just, I didn't know, it wasn't even on my radar. So when I came face to face with it, of course, I was convicted of my own lack of action. We were doing a lot of great things in the marketplace. And we, were, we were doing discipleship training with our employees. We led people to the Lord, ministering through the marketplace, but I wasn't doing anything for the least of these. I wasn't doing anything for the voiceless as you just read in that scripture. Until that day, I came face to face with it and I was broken over my own lack of action. You're just one person, so somebody's watching today, what can one person do? What has happened? What's taking yeah. place? I just would say I'm an ordinary guy, first off. I mean, I'm a small business owner. Uh, it's a commercial cleaning company. It's nothing special. It's not a, fa a fancy business even. It's a blue collar industry that we're in. The Lord's hand has been on it and, we, and blessed it and we're spread throughout the Southeast. But I'm an ordinary guy and I just came face to face with this and I began praying and asking, what would you have me do? And after a couple of years getting involved with some pregnancy care centers and other ministries in the city, uh, during a season of prayer and fasting, the Lord began to really speak to me about this. And on August 20th, uh, 2015, I felt the Lord speak very clearly to me. I've called you to the least of these, and I've called you to be a voice for the voiceless. And over the course of a week, God has started waking me up in the middle of the night downloading a strategy and a plan to mobilize the church. And that's what became Love Life. We launched in 2016. How serious is the issue of abortion? 
Okay. It was law in 1973. Mm -hmm. It's happening every day. Yeah. How serious? Somebody, somebody watching, and I'm, I'm going to play the other side for a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of things that happen in America that aren't good. Mm -hmm. Why this issue? Why not other issues? Mm -hmm. How serious is this in this nation? And not just here, but around the world. Yeah, I really believe it's the greatest moral issue, not only of our time, but really in the history of the world. Uh, we are seeing death and destruction on a scale like we've never seen before in the history of the world. Since 1980, the best numbers we have abortion globally, since 1980, 1 1.5 billion have been murdered in the womb. This is the greatest Holocaust that not only our nation, but the world has ever seen. We know World War II, Nazi Germany, um, you know, around 10 million people were, were murdered during that time. Again, it, with abortion, since 1980, 1 1.5 billion have been murdered in the womb. Here locally in our city, in the Charlotte area, we have about 150 to 200 abortions happening every week. Not every month, every week. This is the leading cause of death in our community. It's not cancer, it's not heart disease, it's not gang violence. Abortion is the leading cause of death in our cities. So I believe that it, it, it is the greatest moral issue of our time, but I also believe that these abortion centers are the greatest uh, mission fields for the church to respond to. Where else do we know where hurting, broken people are that are feeling hopeless, that are showing up to murder their child? What, what other place in our cities exists with, with those type of things? broken, hurting people that are feeling hopeless, that are showing up to murder their child. That's why the Christians must be present to bring hope. We have the answer. We have the hope. We have the gospel. We should be showing up to give people other options, other resources, to let them know they're not alone. So yes, it is the greatest moral issue of our time, but this is also the greatest mission field of our time, and we must respond to it. So where is the disconnect? Because if we knew, for instance, that this week at a local business, mm -hmm. 150 people were going to be murdered, right. we, we would be jumping up and down saying, we've got to do something. Yeah. Where's the disconnect? Because this is happening every week mm -hmm. in Charlotte, but not just in Charlotte, across the yeah. nation and around the world. Where's the disconnect? Why do you think that this, the response is so passive mm -hmm. sometimes? Yeah, I think you, everyone has to ask the question genuinely, like I did in 2012 when I stood in front of that abortion clinic, do I really believe it's a life? It sounds so simple, but we must ask that question, do we really believe it's a life? Not 50% alive or 90% alive, but do we believe that life in the womb has the same value is what my one and a half year old child at home has, or my six year old child, do we believe it has the same exact value? And if it does, if you come to the conclusion that it does, which I believe God's word speaks very clearly to that, um, whenever it says that the baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb, referring to John the Baptist, it uses the word berephos. In the very next chapter, describing the baby outside of the womb, talking about Jesus in the manger, the same exact words, berephos, is used. So in other words, God used the same word to describe the baby in the womb as the same exact word to describe the baby outside of the womb. And we can go on and on throughout scripture with that. But if we believe that it's a life, then we must change our behavior on behalf of the most vulnerable among us. So I think it begins with asking that question and really coming to a personal conviction about it. But it can't just be something that changes in our heart. It must change in our behavior. True repentance is not just a prayer. Repentance is a behavior change, producing fruit and, and keeping with repentance. And, and honestly, I just don't believe that we've gotten there yet in general as a church where we're truly living out true repentance. So would it be fair to say that the issue really is an abortion? That's right. The issue is how the church has responded to this. Absolutely. I, th I think the issue is not abortion. The issue is not the darkness. The issue has been the absence of light. 
It's that we have not responded. We have not repented. We have not changed our behavior in general. Now, there are some like yourself, Pastor Mark, that I'm so thankful for. Pastors that are taking a strong stand on life. Watchmen and leaders across this city and Greensboro and Raleigh and New York City and many other cities as well. But in general, the church has been silent. Uh, pulpits have been silent. Unfortunately, a lot of times the, uh, the White House has spoke more clearly on abortion than our pulpits have. Mm. And, and that's, it's not their job. I, we, I believe with all my heart that God has called the church to shape the culture. You had mentioned, I think, that there's 800 abortion clinics across America. Correct. Is that right? Yep. And what percentage of those actually have anybody there that's a Christian presence? Yeah, to the best of our knowledge, we're building this data right now for a national move. Uh, but right now we're projecting around 30% out of those 800 abortion centers have somewhat of a regular Christian witness at it. That means that 70% of those 800 abortion clinics have no Christian witness have, have no gospel message, have no hope that is being offered. People are just going in and out of those abortion clinics without any resistance or any hope being offered to them. That's a travesty. Some of those abortion clinics are in the largest cities of America that have some of the largest churches in America. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, Atlanta, uh, Miami, you go on and on and on. I mean, a lot of New York City, there's 35 abortion centers in New York City. 35. We, now, we're doing ministry at the largest one there, but for the most part, th none of those abortion clinics have a Christian witness at them. Church buildings right next door, but no, no one out there in the streets to offer hope or offer another way. And, but I believe now is the time. Now is the time for us to respond to this. And we're not just pointing our finger and saying, church, why haven't you been there? We're saying, let's go. Now is the time to respond. Um, I believe we have a window of time. Right now, I believe it's a mercy of God, even in the midst of this coronavirus, where he is highlighting this great hypocrisy that exists in our land. Look what we're willing to do to protect one another from this virus, to protect the most vulnerable from this virus. I believe now it's highlighting this hypocrisy of saying, now what are we doing for the most vulnerable? Those that, children that are being murdered at these abortion clinics. Our behavior must change on behalf of them, just like our behavior has changed on behalf of those with the virus. Jessica, you were 16 years old and you had a child. Mm -hmm. And then you found yourself pregnant again uh, when you were 19. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that story and what happened. Well, um, uh, first thing I want to start off saying is um, for anyone, you know, who's been in this situation, we're not condemning you. We are here um, to give you um, the hope yeah. and yeah. the restoration Amen. that Jesus gives. Amen. Um, but yes, I, I was 16 years old when I had my first child. And 19, I found myself pregnant again, um, living the life I wanted to live, not the life that the Lord wanted to live. And at that time, I didn't know him. Um, and I found myself pregnant and at an abortion clinic, um, selfishly having an abortion um, because it didn't fit in my life because I already had a child. And I didn't want to be looked at, you know, like everyone else, you know, in my town. There were a lot of girls who had multiple children and people would, you know, talk about them and say, mm. you know, things about them. And I didn't want to be that person. Mm. And that was, that was definitely not any reason to have an abortion. And 
like I said, it's a lot of times it's, it's selfishness. It's the heart, and my heart was not right at the time. Was that a decision um, that you feel you were making on your own, or were there other individuals telling you, yes, this is a good decision, go ahead and do it, or was somebody saying, no, don't do it, and you're torn between the two? How, what was that decision-making like? Um, no, at that time, no, there was no one pressuring me. Um, I just, it was what you did. If you were pregnant, found yourself pregnant, and you didn't want to, you know, have a child, because I, um, like I said, I've known lots of, you know, women that I grew up with that had abortions, and um, some of them already had multiple children and had multiple abortions, so I felt like that was what you did, mm -hmm. and I was so misguided. Mm -hmm. It was just that, misguidance and not pressure at the time. So the, uh, you have the abortion. Mm -hmm. Some people would say that it's just a, a fetus. It's not really a human being. You have the abortion. What does this do? How does this affect you emotionally and spiritually? Because some would like to say, well, it's just, you know, you go in, you get it taken care of, you move on with your life, and it's not an issue. It is an issue. Um, mm. It's an issue that you mm. carry around for your, for your life, you know, and mm. it's not something that you share a lot with people because you're, you feel guilt and shame. And with me, I, that's what happened. I felt that, and when I would have those instances, I would just push it back down and move on. And for a while, you know, it would be maybe years later um, until it came back again, that feeling and that emotion. And, um, and I, never, I never dealt with it until, <laughs> until a 40-week prayer walk. Mm -hmm. um, and November 2018 was the first prayer walk that I had been to. And at the end of the prayer walk, they had asked um, if anybody wanted to, you know, that had had an abortion in their past, wanted to come up and be prayed for. And I went up and that was when I finally felt a peace mm. and was able to let God take that mm. burden from me. Amen. And... Um, <clears throat> It's actually kind of um, a God thing how it all came to this all came together with me now volunteering um, with uh, Cities for Life and Love Life. Um, I text Tiffany and said to her, I asked her if there Tiffany was... Tiffany would be the pastor's wife, yes, is that right? Yes, Tiffany <laughs> the pastor's wife. Um, asked her if um, a woman that goes to church here had, was still involved with the pregnancy care center here because I wanted to get involved. And um, she said, hold on, um, Pastor Mark is working on something right now. Let me get back to you. It might be a day or so or whatever. And it was, I don't know, it was a short period of time. It might have been an hour or, or so later. She texted me back and she said, well, um, we're going to be partnering with this organization love life. And I was like, what? How, how is that? That's just God. Yeah, he put this all together. Yeah. And then it was, I don't know, a month or so later, and we had our um, prayer walk with love life. And now I got involved with the sidewalk ministry, Amazing. mentoring. Amazing. So what would you say to somebody right now that has had an abortion? What has God done for you? How has he taken this in touched your life? What's he done first of all on the inside of you and then? I feel uh, you never, you, you never get rid of that, um, that thought, you know, or that you still, you, you think about it and it's, it's still, it's, you have pain, you know, from that and, but knowing that God is a forgiving God mm. and a gracious God. Mm. You, it, you can let that go. Mm. And for 
you know, um, it's just a peace now mm -hmm. that I have with it. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that anybody could experience that peace. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want folks to understand, and those of you that are watching, that the organization of Love Life is not a protest organization. I know sometimes when these social issues are dealt with, it appears that, oh, they're going down there to protest. That's not what happens. And Justin, can you just kind of explain, because I want people to understand mm -hmm. what happens in a prayer walk. Yeah. And I also want them to understand this isn't just Charlotte. Now, this is expanding. And, and folks, I want you to know this has turned into a movement that's spreading across America. So what does it, what does it look like? Uh, because there's no people yelling and screaming, and that's mm -hmm. what we get accused of, I know. But, right. but that's right. not happening. So what does, this, what does a prayer walk look like? Yeah, I just want to piggyback really quickly on Jessica's powerful story. First off, thank you for sharing your heart. And thank I just you. want to speak to everybody that's, that's watching and listening. The work that has been done in her heart is really what the Lord wants to do in anybody that has walked this road. You know, and, and we're talking to men and women, because it's not just one out of four women that have an abortion, it's also one out of four men. Mm -hmm. and, and so we want to see that same healing come to everybody. I truly believe that um, people like Jessica that have walked this road before, first off, you're not post-abortive, you're a new creation. You are a restored life. And yes. that's what you identify as. You're not someone who's post-abortive. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And we want to we want to walk with you just as we walk with Jessica and many others. If you've had an abortion in your past, we want to come alongside you, get you plugged into a post-abortive Bible study so you can walk mm -hmm. through your own healing and restoration. Mm -hmm. Because I believe people that have walked this road before really are the Navy SEALs of this movement. And you see it so perfectly in Jessica's story. I mean, here a pastor um, took a stand on life and encouraged his congregation to come and participate. You receive healing and now you're on the front lines giving hope and, and resources to families that are coming for abortions. I mean, what an amazing work God has done in your life and now he's using you to help rescue those who are being led to slaughter and help rescue those that, so they don't have to go through what you walk through. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a beautiful picture of what church engagement and response looks like. And so thank you, Pastor, for taking the stand and thank you for your yes and being vulnerable with people because your testimony is helping set other people free. But yeah, this is not a protest. This is not a demonstration. Yeah. Um, this is a prayer movement, ultimately, is what, what this is. The very backbone of love life is, is prayer and fasting. We realize this is a spiritual battle that requires a spiritual response and using spiritual weapons. Um, and so Mark 9, 29 says this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting. We believe we're dealing with a spirit here. Our battle is not with the abortionist, it's not with the workers, it's not with this industry, it's not with politicians. This is a spiritual battle that must be fought with spiritual weapons. So we do prayer walks. Um, right now we're not doing the large gathering prayer walks because we're in the midst of COVID-19 in this crisis, but we are doing virtual prayer walks that we're gonna encourage people to join in with us this Saturday on. But we're in Charlotte, we're in Greensboro, we're in Raleigh, and now we're in New York City. Those are the four cities that we have a, a concentration in. But now over the last month, um, since COVID-19 and since I've been arrested, we've really seen the Lord really expand our tent. And now we're, we're going to take you this Saturday to over 20 abortion centers across the nation where a local pastor with a handful of people will be. They'll be out there praying. They're offering hope. They're offering resources. They're offering real options to these families. Again, these are legitimate mission fields that demand a Christian witness. And that's our hope, is to see a Christian witness at every abortion center across America and, and eventually around the world. You had mentioned about being arrested, okay? So let's go back there for a minute. Okay. Uh, you're in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. And what happened, because I want people to understand this, uh, because what you see on the news sometimes doesn't always, is, is not always all the facts. Sure. So what happened in Greensboro that day? Yeah, so the truth about Greensboro is that there is only five people out there on private land that we have permission to be on from the owner, social distancing with a huge bottle of hand sanitizer right there with us, and we got arrested for being out there because we were by an abortion center. 
That's what happened. Three people were arrested while social distancing on private land. We were cited, the when the police arrived, they cited us for an illegal gathering of over 10 people. And I said, sir, there's, there's only five people here. Why are you writing this on our ticket? And he said, that's a mistake. And he goes back and he pulls all of the tickets out of our hands and goes back to his car and he draws a line through it and says, he changes it to unlawful travel for non-essential things, which just shows there is a premeditation and what they were wanting to do. But he commanded us to leave and we just said, sir, we cannot leave. There's over 30 people inside that building right now um, with no restrictions, packing them into a small building, about 800 square foot building, over 30 people in this building, no social distancing happening. Five people out here in the open air, spread out with hand sanitizer, are being the ones arrested. And we have, com we have commands from Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves. And, and so we said, sir, we respectfully decline. We must be here to offer these families hope, to offer them another way. Right before that, we had counseled a young man that had been sitting in the parking lot um, while his girlfriend was in there having an abortion. And Isaiah, one of our leaders up there in Greensboro, got to have almost an hour conversation with this young man, just saying, hey man, you, you can go in there, you can get her out, you can, you can be the father that God has called you to be. And he wrestled with it and he wrestled with it. Uh, we offered even to adopt his child. We said, man, we got resources, whatever it takes, we will walk with you. Um, ultimately, he decided not to go in there, but then we were able to counsel him uh, in his grief because now he, he turned to a grieving father. He realized that, man, I just lost my child. I just lost my child. So we got to counsel him and, and do healing and restoration. Say, we're, we're still here for you, bro. We want to walk with you through your healing and restoration process. But without a Christian witness there, people just go in and out with no, with, 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 with no hope, with no restoration offered. So we, we said we must stand, and we were arrested because we stood. And uh, ADF mm -hmm. um, has began defending Correct. You correct. And also those that were in Charlotte, because were there not arrests in Charlotte as well? There were. So that, our arrest took place on a Saturday about five weeks ago in Greensboro. We went back out the following Monday because the police now have commanded that no Christians can be out there. Not our sidewalk team, not the mobile team that offers the free ultrasounds. Nobody was allowed to be out there. And we talked with the pastors in the area. One of the pastors of the church literally next door to the abortion center, Pastor Lee Stokes. Uh, this is his neighborhood. This is his neighborhood. And uh, we decided that we must stand. Uh, we must have a Christian witness at this place of death. And so on Monday, the following, following that Saturday, some pastors in Greensboro, myself, we walked back over there. Uh, more arrests took place in Greensboro that day. Local pastors from that city that were arrested. But because they stood, the very next day, the police came back and changed the ordinance and now allowed our sidewalk team to be out there with the mobile unit. Because Christians stood, now a Christian witness is allowed back out at that abortion Somebody clinic. went and spoke up. Yeah. Somebody said something. I want, yeah. Those of you listening, you, you, whatever situation you're dealing with, and particularly with this, you have to speak up. Yeah. We, we can no longer be silent. I want those that are watching to understand how connected God is with this whole issue of life. Mm. On January 22nd of last year, yeah. 2019, most of us saw the news coming out from the governor in the state of New York mm -hmm. where they signed a new bill mm -hmm. where you could take the life of a child up to full term. And we remember the cheers, the clapping, the smiling, Tell us what happened on January 21st of this year. Yeah, January 21st this year, one year later, almost to the day, January 22nd, it was signed into law in 2019. Uh, January 21st, 2020, was the four, first reported COVID-19 um, uh, virus in New York City, January 21st, the very first one reported. And now New York City, we know, has become uh, the epicenter of this virus as it is also the abortion capital of America. Hmm. New York City is the abortion capital of America. More African-American babies are aborted in New York City than are born. And so I, I believe there is a reaping of what we've sown. 
Um, we're, we're reaping in the streets what we've sown in the womb, um, and, so to speak. And, and so I, I believe it's not a coincidence. You know, obviously I can't prove that, but that's the reality. That's, that's what's taking place. Well, I remember when I was in New York City uh, back uh, last uh, summer mm -hmm. for the Love Life uh, prayer walk. And this is what I want folks to understand. We walked from the church down to Planned Parenthood and we're there the period of time. Uh, we're standing, worshiping, praying. That's all. Of course, the police are always there. Um, the Catholic Church was also there. And then we walked back um, probably a 15 to 20 minute walk or so from the abortion center back to the church. And this is when I realized what was happening with love life. And I want people to grab a hold of this. This is not something that is protesting abortion. This has become a revival movement. Mm. We went back to the church and we began to worship pray, and I stood there and I said, I'm in a revival meeting right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a service where people are worshiping the Lord, we're praying. It was so very, very powerful. Mm. Do you believe, and I'm going to ask both of you this question, that this is not just about stopping abortion. But there's a larger picture of God trying to bring a supernatural awakening to America. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, abso I believe he's using this to revive us again. It's if my people, if my people, talking about Christians, talking about the church, if my people, again, the issue is not the darkness. If yeah. my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. That's the key. we got to change our behavior, turn from our wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Revival will come. I remember uh, a number that uh, was spoken in one of our prayer walks of the percentages of individuals who get abortions that identify as Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what was that number? It's 54%. Okay, I need all of you to grab a hold of that. 54% mm -hmm. of those today and this week that are having an abortion identify as a Christian. And this is why I think the scripture is so mm -hmm. important and I'm hoping mm -hmm. that we can come to a place of deep, mm -hmm. deep repentance. Because yeah. I don't know that yeah. we're there. No. And it's not the world out there that's right. got to repent. Right. He says, if my people, mm -hmm. the people of God have to change right. their ways. Jessica, what do you see God doing right now with this across the nation? Um. What do you see God doing just with you right now? Because I know that you're, you're helping watching, people right now. Well, watching um, these virtual prayer walks, um, and like Justin said earlier, you know, each week there's more and more churches getting involved. So uh, this thing where they've tried to keep us from gathering together we're still gathering together and it's growing. Mm, yeah. So what, whatever, you know, God sets in place, they're not going to stop. Yeah. So I just see that, you know, eventually and hopefully soon because it's growing so fast that we'll have more than 30% uh, Christian witness at a, an abortion clinic. We'll have 90. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know, I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, and I heard somebody say, if you were born after 1973, you're a miracle mm -hmm. because at that point your life could be taken legally. Right. I don't think in my lifetime that I have ever seen such a move across America of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and many of the, the moral battles of the day you know, are fought on the political battlefield. Mm -hmm. 
But this is not a political thing. Right. This right. is a spiritual thing. That's right. And God is calling the church to place their hands maybe where they haven't placed their hands mm. before because we've been yeah. very comfortable within our four walls. Yeah. Right? yeah. Doing our thing. Yeah. You're right. And I, and I think that just to put it simply for everybody that's listening, is that, you know, you can get in the weeds on a lot of different data and scientific mm. and scriptures. This is about loving God and loving our neighbor. If we want to, we want to just make it as simply as possible. This is about loving God and loving our neighbor. And that includes the born, the moms and the dads, the workers that are struggling with this and the unborn. That's what this is, obeying the commands of Christ. And, and to do that, we must repent because we have, we've been apathetic. We have been silent. Uh, I believe that we, we are living in an Isaiah 1 moment. I encourage everybody to read Isaiah 1, meditate on Isaiah 1. I believe that if, if God were sitting here himself right now to speak to us directly, audibly, he would say a lot of what Isaiah 1 has to say. He says, you're having great worship services. You're having great prayer meetings. You're having a lot of great religious activity, as it all talks about in Isaiah chapter 1. But you're not caring for the most vulnerable among you. There is still bloodshed that is taking place in your city. And the backdrop of Isaiah 1 is that their children were being sacrificed in the valley of ben Hinnom, right next door to Jerusalem. They were having a great religious activity, but right next door was the valley of ben Hinnom, where children were being sacrificed. And in Isaiah 1, it says, I hate your behavior. And he says, I'm not listening to you because your hands are full of blood. He's See, talking to God's people. He's talking yeah. to his people. Yeah. He's talking to the church. I'm not listening to you because your hands are full of blood. Seek justice. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. I believe that is his word for us today. We must repent. We've got to change our behavior on behalf of the most vulnerable among us. I want us to get the imagery of that Isaiah 1 passage because um, in looking at the geography of Jerusalem, the mm -hmm. city of Jerusalem, I can picture in my mind where the temple would have been located. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you're driving around um, the city, it's not a long distance from where the worship was happening. Yeah. As you look outside the city walls in this, uh, it was called the Valley of Ben Hinnom or mm -hmm. Gehenna. Mm -hmm. um, it initially, uh, they, they burned trash there. Mm -hmm. Back in the, in the time of God's people, they were sacrificing children to Molech. Mm -hmm. They were taking their babies and replacing them literally on the fire. And, he, and, and this is the one thing God says, you cause your children mm -hmm. to pass through the fire. And off in the distance, there's worship going on. And over here, mm -hmm. um, they're sacrificing children. Yeah. And I think the imagery is so powerful as mm -hmm. we talk about 2020. Yeah. We're worshiping in our churches. Mm -hmm. And down the street is an abortion center yeah. Yeah. where they're taking the lives of children yeah. and somehow the, the church is, is over here and the abortion clinic is over here and God yeah. is saying, look, um, I'm not listening to your prayers mm -hmm. because you're not speaking up. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a yeah, fair... Yeah, that's it. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's exactly it. And I think we talked about this earlier about how I think a lot of times, you know, for, for Christians, and I, I know I was there, I was unaware. I yeah. was unaware Number one. Yeah, so what can somebody do? Yeah, and aware, so, so, and so we, we, right we want to speak that to people. Like we, we, we know that maybe some of you are hearing this for the first time and you're not aware of this tragic truth that exists in our cities. And then we also kind of just think somebody else is going to take care of it. And somebody yeah. else is doing it. Justin's doing it. Right. And I get a lot of times when I speak at churches, at the, as I go out to the back, people pat me on the back. Man, I'm so glad you're doing something about it. And I'm like, oh, great. So I'll, I'll see you on Saturday, right? And I go, no, I can't. I got a ball game or whatever. And, it, yeah. and we, just, we always think somebody else is going to do it. No, he's called you. He's called me. He's called all of us. We don't get to pick the giant in our land. David didn't get to pick the Goliath of oh, his that's, day. That's very good. He, yeah. You know, he was yeah. simply delivering right. pizza to his brothers, yeah. right? Bread yeah. and cheese, we call that pizza. He's delivering yeah. pizza to his brothers, just being faithful as a shepherd boy. He didn't get to pick the giant in his land. Neither do I, neither do you. Um, God picked the time and the place in which we would live, as Acts 17, 26 tells us. He picked the time and the place in which we would live. But we choose how we will live in that time and in that place. And so this is the giant in our, in our land. We don't get to pick it, but we, we choose how we respond. 
and how we act. And so now you know, you know what's happening in our cities. Um, don't think somebody else is going to take care of it. It's not up to politicians. It's not up to legislation. Yeah. God called the church of Jesus Christ to be the pillar and the foundation of truth. Not President Trump, not our governor. He called the church to be the pillar and the foundation of truth. He's called us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so you can get involved. You know, if you're here in Charlotte, you can get involved directly with Love Life. We, you can be a part of our prayer and fasting team. You can be a mentor, as I know you have for moms. You can mentor a mom or dad who's made the choice for life. You can be involved in the sidewalk outreach teams. Be literally on the sidewalks at the abortion centers, letting moms know there's another way. God loves you. He loves your child. We're here to walk with you, whatever that takes. We're here to walk with you as a church. You can get involved in orphan care. Because God has called us to care for the orphans as a whole, right? Not just the orphan in the womb, but also the orphan outside of the womb. So through foster care, through adoption, everybody can do something. What is the address uh, of Love Life? They want to go online. What do they look yeah. for? Lovelife.org is the, is the website. When you go on to that website, you'll see right at the very top uh, what to click on for the virtual prayer walk that will be happening this Saturday beginning at 9 a.m. We'll begin with some worship and prayer. And then at 9.29, we're going to take you live in front of abortion centers around this nation. We're going to have local pastors on the ground that are going to give us a live feed. And we're going to get a pray for moms that are literally walking into abortion clinics around this nation. And we've seen the power of prayer. Just this last week, um, a mom came out because she heard the audible voice of God speak to her while she was sitting in the waiting room and she got That's up and she cool. made the yeah. choice for life. We've, we've mm -hmm. been on the front lines through this virtual prayer walk in New York City, seeing a mom about to walk into the Planned Parenthood and we say, now everybody at home, stretch your hand and let's begin praying for this mom. And literally on the live feed, we see that mom turn around, walk with our counselors and make the choice for life, went and got a free ultrasound. And then the next Saturday, we showed everybody the ultrasound of that baby that was saved that they had prayed for the mm -hmm. previous week week. You have the chance to co-labor with God in this. I'm telling you that God wants to see abortion in more than we do. Mm. He just has been waiting for yeah. the church to labor with him, and we get that opportunity. So this week is our adoption week, um, and a number of other churches are also taking this week as the adoption week. And what we're asking you to do on Wednesday is to take some time in prayer and fasting uh, as it relates to this particular subject and the Charlotte abortion clinics and because there's more than one clinic in yeah, Charlotte. Yeah, there's four. There's four. Uh, and if I, if I remember right, just the Latrobe address mm -hmm. um, has had over 100,000 abortions, abortions mm -hmm. since like 2001. Is that right? Yeah, over 100,000 children have been murdered mm -hmm. there, yeah. So what we're asking you to do on Wednesday is join us in prayer and fasting and then on Saturday morning... From 9 to 9.29, there's, there's some worship going on. Uh, and then at 9.29 on the Love Life Facebook page, mm -hmm. okay, there'll be an hour virtual prayer meeting, and we're going around the nation to 20 different abortion clinics, and we're just going to be praying over each of those places. Listen, the power of prayer goes beyond where we can go. Yes. Yeah. And this is what God is asking us mm -hmm. to do, and we're asking you to be part of this. We can't go as a large group mm. on site, but we can go as a large group online and there is no distance in prayer. We want to take a moment right now and pray. Mm. And I'm going to have both of you pray. Mm. Justin, I want you to pray for the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Help us. Yes. That our repentance and honestly, personally, yeah. I feel like in, in, in many ways, our repentance, and this is for me personally, even sometimes my repentance hasn't gone deep enough. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I want you to pray for the church. And then, Jessica, I'm going to ask you just to pray over somebody that is making the decision as they're watching or somebody that has already had an abortion. I want them to hear the hope mm. of Jesus. Just in yeah. prayer with the church yeah. for a moment. Yeah, Lord, we, we come to you, Lord, because our confidence is in you. Lord, we trust in you. We thank you for what you've done in our lives, Lord. We thank you that our names are written in your book. And this is what we rejoice in, Lord. This is the hope that we have, that we once were lost and now we're found. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become like the righteousness of God. And Lord, I, I pray that we won't, we won't uh, hoard this hope, but we will take it to the darkest places of our cities, Lord. Lord, I pray for the church of Jesus Christ, the bride, who you love, who I love, Lord, your people. Lord, I pray that you will break our hearts for what breaks yours. Lord, but not only that our hearts will be broken, but our actions will change, that our actions will align with our broken hearts, that there will be true repentance within the church. Lord, I confess before you on behalf of the church as well that we have been complacent, that we have been selfish, we have been self-absorbed. Lord, forgive us for this. Forgive us for being more concerned about ourselves, more concerned about our, our own families, our own schedules, about building our own kingdoms. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done is what we, what we cry out for, for your will to be done. Forgive us of our complacency, Lord. And Lord, I pray for a fresh stirring, a fresh awakening. Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see. Open up our eyes, Lord. Let us see as you see. Help us to feel as you feel, Lord. Help us to, to, to look at these moms and these children in the womb as we would look at our own family members, as we would look at our children, as we would look at people that are in our churches, Lord. Help us to care about them in that way. Because, Lord, we know that you do. These are your kids. These are your children. Lord, give us that revelation. Give us that burning. Give us that depth of, of repentance, Lord, in our hearts. Forgive us for allowing this innocent bloodshed to take place for so many years. Forgive us, Lord, for the 40 plus years that we have allowed this to take place in our backyards, in our cities, while we've been having our church services, Lord. Turn our hearts to you, Lord. Lord we're praying for true repentance. True yes. repentance, Lord, that we're, we produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Our behavior changes on behalf of the most vulnerable. It's not just opposition without action. It's opposition with action. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, give us this heart. This is what we cry, are crying out for, Lord, within the body of Christ. Lord, for you to, to turn this thing around in us. We recognize it's got to begin in us. Repentance begins in the house of God, in us, in our own hearts, with our families, with our churches. Stir us again, Lord Jesus. In yes, your name yes. we pray. Jessica, pray over somebody right now. <clears throat> Father God, Jesus. I just pray over that mother who is contemplating an abortion. Yes, Lord. Because she's fearful uh, due to this coronavirus that has made um, people mm -hmm. unsteady, uneasy, not knowing, um, not having hope. I just pray, Father God, for her mm -hmm. to know that there is hope and yeah. that we have that hope. The church can give her the things that she needs for her baby. Yeah. And we just pray, Father, um, that you will um, press on her heart, Lord, mm. and turn her heart back to her child. Yeah. And that, <clears throat> that child is precious. That child has purpose. Mm. And that she not um, take away that purpose, Lord. Mm. Yes, Lord. And we pray for the fathers as well, yeah. Lord. We pray that they will be courageous yes. and stand Ooh. up for their child. Yes, and not just sit back and say, this is a woman's issue. This is her choice because it's her body. Because it's not her body, Lord. It's your child, the child that you're forming in her womb. And Lord, we just ask that they will love their baby and turn their heart back to, to that child. Yes, Lord. Soften their hearts. And I pray for, <clears throat> excuse me, I pray for any mother who has gone mm. through an abortion, yeah. that they can have a peace. Mm. They can have um, the grace that God gives. Mm. Uh, yes, Lord. All they need to do is just trust him mm. and give their heart to him and to know that he is Lord and that he will lead them to that place mm -hmm. and that the church is here as well yeah. 
to walk with them through that. There are many organizations that will walk with them, Father. And I just ask, Lord, that you be with all these um, men and women, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah. Yes, Amen. Those of you watching today, right now, you mm. can click to raise your hand mm. to give your life to Christ. Mm. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. It doesn't matter what has taken place in your life, what you feel you have done, what has happened. Right now, Jesus is standing mm. there yeah. waiting on you, and you just can easily say yes to Jesus. If that's you, click it right now. Raise your hand to say yes I want to serve Jesus Christ the rest of my life. Thank you for being with us today at Church Online. And guys, you guys are amazing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're awesome. Thanks for having us, man. You. Thank you um, so much uh, for being here today. And uh, Jessica, for sharing your story. Thank you. And, and for Justin, what God is doing you, through uh, Love Life. We want to remind those of you watching this coming Thursday night to make sure you're with us at 7 p.m. live for Midweek Talks. And we'll be uh, having another subject. We take your questions, we answer them live on air. And uh, we're just honored that you'd spend some time with us. And we're just so thrilled that you spent time with us today too. Thank you, man. Thank you for being a watchman in this city. Thank Appreciate yes. you. Amen. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks for joining us today. We will see you next week at Church Online.